series and again Merry Christmas, early Merry Christmas to you all. I love this Advent series. Uh, Chris last week uh, broke down a uh, wonderful counselor and I had some uh, things that I wanted to say too but Chris did such a great job and, and like I told you last week it would have uh, went on until about 12 so I'm glad that I get to unpack it this week. But let's, uh, and Beth already kind of alluded to what Advent is all about, but I want to read it again. It is meant as a celebration of the earthly birth of Jesus, but also as a preparation. And preparation, that word is the theme this week. And so I want you to really think about that as we go over this message. Preparation and anticipation for the second coming of Christ. Our first week's message, if we remember a couple weeks ago, was Emmanuel, God with us. And last week, we challenged you to see, did you have that moment throughout the week where you needed to say, whether in your own heart and in your mind, or you needed to proclaim it, you needed to express it, that God is with us. Did God give you that opportunity, and did you take that opportunity? The second week, which was what Chris spoke on last week, was Wonderful Counselor. And we ended last week talking about how we have head knowledge now, as what she presented of what a wonderful counselor looks like from the Word of God. We've learned about the wonderful counselor's attributes. We've learned that we have access to the wonderful counselor. But this week, we're going to take it a step further. We're going to focus on the role that we play in our preparation to be counseled. So we know that there is a counselor there that wants to counsel us, and he's wonderful. But I wonder, and this was something last week I said that I have a lot of experience with, my wife and I, through our marriage counseling, we've gone to four counselors. And I even remember uh, a time when my wife said that she had counseling early on uh, during, during a, a college uh, time where she was struggling with an eating disorder. And I started to think about how we prepare for our counseling appointments. And I know that originally in the first three counselors, uh, I had my guard up. I was very defensive. I was an attorney and I wanted to tell the counselor all the things that were wrong with my wife, right? And so if you think about the heart that I went in there, and then the other thing I did was, and I think about this, you're paying money to get some advice from somebody that's supposedly gonna help you, and you're sitting there putting on a facade and trying to prove your point. I mean, even if that counselor stood up and said, you are so right, I mean, what did I win there? You know, it's amazing what goes through our mind and the facade that we sometimes put on for each other, but really for God, right? And so how do I get the most out of my counseling appointment? Well, I got an idea. First, you have to set the appointment. <laughs> you have to actually want an appointment and you actually have to set a time. So many people now that we've referred to as we're walking right alongside them in faith, but we know how Christian counseling can help as well, unpack some things in their lives. and we. We say, hey, have you made that appointment yet? Oh, I know, I know I need to, I know I need to. And how many times have we said that? I know I need to make that appointment. So you have to set the appointment and it's gotta be a specific time. Otherwise, imagine that we'll get busy and something else will get in the way of that appointment that we know that we need. So how do we prepare ourselves for our wonderful counselor, counselor appointment, counseling appointment? We're gonna ask three important questions accompanied by three action items. The first question is this, are you ready to be honest with him, even about the painful and the secret parts of your life? The first action item is this, we must be brutally, I like that word, we, we must be brutally honest with the wonderful counselor. By the way, he knows everything anyways, so you're actually being brutally honest with who? Yourself. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. He will never let the righteous fall. 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Look what it says in the message. Uh, Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll carry your load. He'll help you out. He'll never let good people topple into ruin. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden.
hurt in his life. I've been talking with the men about this. If there's anything that we're taking on in our lives and we're feeling pressure, we're feeling stress, we're feeling the heaviness, I can promise you that you're trying to do it in your own strength. The word does not come back void and the word does not lie. It says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's why we must cast those cares upon the Lord and seek a wonderful counselor. When we look at Jesus, we find a wonderful counselor who's eager to guide us. I love that word, eager to guide us. Revelation 3.20 says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. But we must turn to him in honesty and we must be willing to act in whatever guidance he gives us. We must ask ourselves, are we as willing and as eager to act as our wonderful counselor is to guide? While God absolutely does care about our immediate problems and is ready to help us for our good and for his glory, he's more concerned with taking care of the root, rooted right, of all of our problems, which is our actual separation from him. So what separates us from it? Sin. Sin gets in our way. It gets in our way of feeling close to him, and it gets in our way from hearing from the wonderful counselor. Let's think about this just for an example. How do we pray? Sometimes we find ourselves only praying when we need temporary or situational help. Let's do a little self-analysis here. Honestly ask yourself, what situations cause you to pray? When do you actually go to God? And does it line up with this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18? Rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What would it look like for you to pray for God's nearness in your current circumstance? What kind of counseling appointment would you be seeking right now if I said, what, what, what area of your life right now would you have to set up a counseling appointment with your wonderful counselor? In your current state, what would you be seeking counseling? It's easy for us to think of a counselor as someone who simply listens and who sympathizes with our problems. But Jesus is much more than a sympathizer. He's the authoritative guide. Matthew 28, 18 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's different from you and your friends having a spirited, passionate conversation. We talked about that last week. And bunch of people walk by and hear you guys just you're, you're solving the whole world's problems and someone will joke with you i said that last week hey you guys solve it all yeah we got it all figured out and i started thinking about because i'm a sports guy we talked about that monday morning quarterback and you look back at the game I, I'm, a, I'm you know i'm a football fan so i was a packers fan but uh I'm a fair weather guy right now <laughs> no there's some other things see i have all the answers for aaron Rodgers. i have all the answers but guess what? And I got all the answers for the Packers and I could sit and talk to you guys all about it. But guess what? I have absolutely no authority in Aaron Rodgers' life. I have absolutely no relationship with the Packers, yet I love them. That's head knowledge. Head knowledge of a team that I really like. And many of us have head knowledge of this wonderful counselor that we know is there waiting for us. But what good does my conversation do as a Monday morning quarterback? Although it's fun and it's okay to build relationship with other believers and, and friends that you have, we really didn't accomplish anything because we have no authority in that area. But look at the God that we serve. We must let the word of God and the voice of God get the final say. Jesus not only hears and sympathizes with you, but he's also able to guide and rescue you. So we go to a whole other level. In what ways might your prayers change? and your hope grow and your faith and trust increase if you knew that he was waiting to guide and rescue you. Knowing that Jesus can hear and sympathize with you and then go a step further, he wants to counsel you. Interesting to think about that all of Jesus' miracles, and I challenge you if you, again, are just sitting here hearing about Jesus and, and maybe the word that's being spoken, the message that's being spoken every weekend, as it all should lead back to Jesus. Maybe you're hearing some of those messages, but I just encourage you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, during this Christmas season, 
But if you look at all of Jesus' miracles, they were meant to fix problems. His miracles stemmed from the presentation of a, of a problem, and then Jesus was engaged in miracles regarding hunger, poverty, disease, brokenness, and death. And those aren't just small problems either. He fed hundreds of hungry people. He healed incurable diseases and conditions, and he silenced a storm that threatened to kill disciples, just to name a few. There is absolutely no problem that's too big for Jesus. I love what Pastor Clarence challenged me with when I was living in the dungeon and I was uh, living separated from my wife and it didn't look like our marriage was going to survive and I was about to throw in the towel. And he would challenge me with this question. Are you telling me you are the first person in all of creation ever to walk this face of the earth that, is, that God has something too big that he can't handle your problem? Are you telling me that your problem's too big for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to handle? It's interesting when somebody actually puts that on your plate. Because we can talk all day, oh, I, I'm a believer, I believe in, in Jesus, and I know he can do this, and I've seen what he's done in the Word. But when he put that on my plate, I was not willing to say, you're right, Pastor Clarence. I do serve God that would not be able to heal my marriage. I was not willing to say that. And so then I had to start taking on the mind of Christ. And I started to let him speak those things that are not as though they were from the word of God. The word of God got the final say. So even though my reality said one thing, the word of God got the final say. And so I started walking this thing out. Little by little, I started believing in the things that I actually knew. And that's the difference between heart, head knowledge and heart knowledge. What problems in your life seem too big in your mind to be fixed? Have you really prayed about these problems? Or do you just keep on reminding yourself that someday I hope Jesus steps in? In what ways have you truly asked for help? I was with a couple of the men yesterday afterwards, and I give them so much credit. One was just blatantly honest and said, I don't know how to leave my family. It's awesome. You can't, you can't get a better statement than that. But my question back to him is, what have you done to ask for help? Who have you found in your life that the Lord has placed in your life that can help guide and lead you back to the Word? And he said, I haven't asked anybody. And so here we are isolated. The enemy loves to get us isolated. The enemy loves to get us alone and tell us all your problems that you have that can't be solved. Instead of us looking who God has placed in our lives and then running to the word and then praying and believing God over one another. Remember, there's no problem that Jesus cannot deal with and he actually has the authority over all your problems. On top of that, there's no sin too dark. The world will tell you there is. We have to look at the word being the final say. Nothing can separate. We're going to read that in a second. There's no sin too dark. There's no secret so bad that he will turn you away or stop loving you. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But God wants us to step into our problems and be honest with what is really going on between our ears. The second action item, after being honest with our wonderful counselor, is to listen to the wonderful counselor's voice. Mark 9, 7. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. How can we listen to him? John 10, 28. John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal light and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. God speaks to us through his written word. We're all going to say this together. Yes, we're actually going to talk in church. No word, no relationship. Let's say it together. No word, no relationship. One more time. 
No word, no relationship. We want to be close to God. We want to hear from God. If we're not in the word, we do not have a relationship. God speaks to us through his word. Remember the message that was pre preached a couple weeks ago where we looked at what it says in Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How else does he speak to us besides the word? Yes, through prayer, devotions, Bible studies, relationships with other spirit-filled believers, worship, very important. Most of all, the most important thing, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit inside of us, guiding us. Act, us activating that Holy Spirit. Us talking and communicating with the Lord. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He also speaks through godly counsel. Look what happened in the Old Testament to Moses in Exodus 18. Moses had a big problem. When he was leading the nation of Israel through the wilderness, he was wearing himself out. Anybody worn out? We're going to say this famous word that we all get to say quite a bit. He was busy, busy, busy. Jethro, I love that name. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came to him with some advice. First of all, you've got to be courageous enough to speak some advice in love, right? He said, Moses, here's what you need to do. Select some good men and delegate some of your authority to them. Put some in charge of a thousand, put some in charge of a hundred, put some in charge of 50 and put some in charge of 10. If you do this, God will honor you. How do you get the courageousness to say that? I mean, even if he had a good idea, he spoke that over another brother in Christ. I'm sorry, another believer in God. We didn't have Christ yet. <laughs> He said, if you do this, God will honor you. So is it a crown or a feather in our cap for us to say we're busy, busy, busy? Or is that actually going against what the word of God wants us to be? And he's going to place people around us that help divvy up all the work that needs to be done. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. But guess what Moses did? He listened. He took Jethro's advice. How many times have we surrounded ourselves prayerfully with wise counsel and we still end up doing it our own way? I got to put both hands up in the air on that one. Proverbs 15 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Now you got to be careful who's speaking into your life, and you got to pray about that, and you got to ask God who's linked up with you in the spirit so that when they come to you, you know that you're both going in the same direction, which is putting on the mind of Christ and asking for God's direction in that a spirit-led conversation. We've all had flesh-led conversations. But many times God will bring confirmation in something that you've already been thinking about, haven't spoken it yet, will bring confirmation in another brother in Christ or sister in Christ. After we have decided to be honest and willing to listen to his voice, then comes the second question. The second action item leads us to this question. Do you really want to be healed? Look what it says in John 5, 5 and 6. One who is there, the one who is there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Many of us say that we want to get healed, but we may not want to change. So do you have parts of your life that are off limits to change? What would you do if God asked you to change those parts of your life? Those are conversations between you and God. The final action item today is do what the wonderful counselor tells you to do. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The final question is, are you ready to do what Jesus, the wonderful counselor, says? 
Jesus is our guide, and he will lead us by his word and by his spirit. But do you trust him enough to call the shots in your life? What does it look like for you to trust him and to do what Jesus says? Jesus has more to give to us than we can even imagine. But we must give up doing things our way. We have to get out of our own way sometimes and then get out of God's way. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. When we approach God with our problems, our sins, our hopes, he sympathizes with our weakness and is eager, there's that word again, eagerly waiting to help us. Look what it says in Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Look what it says in verse 16 right there. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Do you consider yourself a confident Christian? And if you don't, let's start asking why. Then let's start asking how. How do I get to that place, Lord? And let God show you those little details that we're missing. Jesus came as a person just like us. He knows what it means to be tempted, to struggle, and to suffer. And as a result, yes, he sympathizes with you, but he suffers alongside us and extends us mercy and grace and counsel whenever we need it. He is our God, and he is our wonderful counselor. What can you bring to Jesus, our wonderful counselor, this week? Jesus wants us to come to him with our problems, our joys, our questions, and our hopes. He is both willing and able to help us and to heal us. Maybe not in the way that you planned it out. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But we have to come to him and be prepared. Just like we're preparing for his birth when we celebrate Christmas, and we're preparing our spirit for the second coming of Christ, we have to be prepared in these three ways. To be fully honest, to be willing to change, and to be ready to do what he says, even if it doesn't make sense to us. In him, we have a better guide than any words or any man could preach about up here. Can you make the decision today to loosen your grip? That's what I want, really want you to think about. Some of us are holding on to some of these areas of our lives so tightly. Can you loosen your grip and look at it as that's the enemy's grip on your secrets, on your fears, and can you loosen the grip on your determination to follow your own counsel or to mix the counsel of God and the counsel of man? At the end of the day, God's word gets the final say. God's spirit inside of you gets the final say. Step out of God's way and allow Jesus to be your counselor. When you hand over your life to Jesus, light will dawn in your darkness. I love that word dawn. It means the first appearance of light in the sky before sunrise. So let's think about those dark areas of our lives. When you give your life to Jesus, light will just begin to come above the horizon. Now that we've thought more deeply about Jesus as our wonderful counselor, in what ways might your relationship with him grow during this Advent series, during this preparation time for Christ's birth and Christmas? We're about to go into our reflection song, and there's not going to be any words, so I just invite you to close your eyes and just get alone with God. I, I can remember sitting out there, and it's amazing what tried to grab my attention while I was sitting. 
there. And especially when I really didn't want the counseling. I might leave here and go, hey, that's pretty good word. Someday, someday I'm going to apply that. Yeah, that was me when I was more looking forward to my sin than what God has for me. Better is one day in your courts, Lord. Better is one day in your courts. I mean, let's think about that. He prom- His word doesn't come back void, void. So better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I started to ask God a lot. What does that mean, Lord? What does that mean? You can always remind God. He doesn't need reminding. You're reminding yourself. You can always remind God what his word says. And so as we sit during this reflection, so I, I just invite you to close your eyes. Let's ask those questions that were presented to us today. Let's be completely honest with God. Let's let him start to shine light in our dark areas of our life. And let's feel his eagerness to counsel us. But in everything, as we've been presenting a lot of the messages, especially since summer, we keep on seeing over and over again that we play a role. There's there's nothing that God can do unless we allow him in. That's the way he created us. He created us for relationship. He created us for communication. And he doesn't force anything upon us. We're not robots. He doesn't make us do anything. So until we truly surrender, until we truly submit, he cannot be what he was, and what he was created to be, which is our wonderful counselor. So while you sit here, I want you to think about Emmanuel, God with us. And I want you to think not just heart no- head knowledge of a wonderful counselor, but what does it mean in your life? And when he tells you to do something, I just encourage you this week, put it into action and just see what's on the other side of obedience. We say that all the time in the men's ministry. I sure know what's on the other side of disobedience. And I know where it got me. In all my best thinking, I know where it got me. But what's on the other side of being obedient to his word and allowing him to be your wonderful counselor? Father, we thank you for the word that went forth today. Lord, we honor you with our heart and with our mind. And with this time right now, we're going to, it's probably about four minutes, Lord. Four minutes. We're going to push everything else out and just allow you to illuminate some of the dark areas of our life. We don't. Some of us don't even know what the root cause is because we're not even dealing with what you've already put on our radar screen. So help us be brave. Help us be courageous. Help us be strong in the Lord and ask you and be brutally honest with ourselves. Lord, we thank you that we do have access to the wonderful counselor and that you eagerly await us to open our heart, give our lives over to you, open up our minds, and let you renew them. Lord, help us to grow in our faith. I know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, we all said this together today, that no word, no relationship. And so if we're lacking the word in our lives, let us let us let that be the starting point this week. Dive into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just read it. And just see the things that you show us in your word. Father, I pray that those that do do that, that your word just jumps off the page to them. Lord, I pray that uh, you would have your way during this time. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us. And that we would be wise enough to listen to the wise counselor. 